All right. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Petropoulos. Thank you so much for joining us today in the next in our Deep Roots, Deep Roots virtual series on native gardening. At Deep Roots, we have been presenting these live sessions since early April and the beginning of the stay at home orders. If you've missed any of this series so far, you can find our previous re events recorded at deeprootskc.org. Click on webinars under events in the drop down menu to access the recorded webinars. This spring 2020 webinar series will come to a close next Tuesday, June 30th, with Linda Lairbaum's in Invasive Species in Large Landscapes presentation. We are thrilled at the enthusiasm that we have received from this series. Deep Roots is looking forward to hosting more virtual webinars this winter and spring. And until then, please consider joining us for our Planet Native conference. We will host Planet Native virtually, and it will feature in-depth sessions, regional and national experts, networking, roundtable discussions, and a buzzing virtual exhibit hall. By holding this conference online, we are reducing both the price and our carbon footprint. Visit planetnative.org for more details or to register online. Today's presentation was originally supposed to be in person at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center. However, we are thrilled to now be hosting it as part of our 2020 virtual series. With continued support from the Arvin L. Gottlieb Foundation, Taylor Creek Restoration Nurseries, and Boulevard Brewing Company. Linda Hessel is the owner of Prairie Birthday Farm in Kearney, Missouri. Linda's beautiful farm uses many different native plants, including several edible native plants. Those of you who attended the Planet Native Conference last year may remember the delicious pawpaw cocktails that were served at happy hour. We are thrilled to have Linda here with us today to teach us more about native edibles. So Linda, I will let you take it away from here. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for the introduction, Mary. Welcome everyone out in Zoom land. I'm delighted you're here to listen and learn and chat with me about growing native trees and shrubs for human and wildlife food. Oh, maybe I should, well, I won't go back. Um, hopefully today I'll help you identify some goals for planting native food producing trees and shrubs and help you list some potential species. Uh, it was hard to pick which ones to include today. There are so many and look at the opportunities and challenges you might face as you make those decisions and uh, know of some resources to help support you in your endeavor. Those are my native wild plum and I'll get to those later, but know that trees and shrubs are really integral to ecosystem regeneration. And I'm saying regeneration rather than sustainability because we have a lot to regenerate. They provide foods, stabilize our soils and climate, uh, helps regulate water flow. And of course they give us shade and shelter and provide habitat for pollinators, pests and their predators. And we need pests to feed the predators. That is a native pawpaw in the photograph. And these, all these photographs are from the farm. Uh, some of the reasons you might consider uh, incorporating native edibles into your landscapes um, are for your own food, obviously, but also food for wildlife. And I'll define that pretty broadly. And also the beauty uh, is so gorgeous in many levels, all the five senses, vision, auditory, auditory um, olfactory, and of course, culinary. It will help us with climate resilience, and we know lots of um, changes are happening there. It would potentially offer you a bit of food security and regenerate the ecosystems. So most of our homes probably displaced um, whole ecosystems to be built. And so we can regenerate just a titch here and there. At Prairie Birthday Farm, you're greeted with, that is elderflower in bloom. I actually just took that a couple of days ago. It is uh, a wild elderberry, bird sown, and it is the most fragrant on the farm. And I've planted dozens from various nurseries and producers. So I have hundreds of fruits, vegetables, herbs, and edible flowers that I've sold since 2000 to as many as 25 chefs around Kansas City. And I've hosted at least one or more apprentices since 2005 to learn about food growing opportunities here on the farm. And prior to COVID, I did farm tours and programs. We're, those are on hold right now. And some of you may wonder where I 
got the name Prairie Birthday Essay, and it was inspired by Aldo Leopold. And I think uh, this is the 50 year anniversary of the Sand County Almanac. And if you haven't read that, I encourage you to do so. In there, he wrote the Prairie Birthday Essay and talks about a plant birthday in June and throughout the season. And we did reconstruct a tiny patch of prairie here. So we feel like we can celebrate plant birthdays across the season. I'm also uh, indebted to and inspired by Rachel Carson. If you haven't read Silent Spring from 61, I think was the publication date, I encourage you to revisit that or visit it for the first time. In which she is quoted as saying, if we don't um, learn to work with nature and continue, continue to war with nature, uh, nature will be in charge eventually. And I think we're approaching that. The evolution of the farm has really gone many steps. So the photograph on the left is how the, the driveway looked to the house in 1993 at Purchase. And the after picture was by 2005, I believe that was taken to show the installation of the small prairie along the drive. And I include this to let you know, it, it's really possible. Transformation can happen and it's just patience. And lots of hard work, of course, and uh, lots of learning opportunities. So those uh, are wild plums in a drop cloth underneath the tree. After years of picking plums up off the ground, I finally figured out that it was a good idea to capture them before they hit the ground. So that's actually a shade cloth suspended on fence posts. And um, lots of production practices happen here, but probably just to highlight a few, I do what's called carbon farming and then I'm planting lots of perennials to store carbon to do what I can for uh, climate mitigation and to lower our CO2 levels. Um, and I also never till. So I do sheet mulching when I plant things with um, cardboard, paper, and then um, grass clippings or, or sawdust. And I've uh, learned over these years to eat the weeds and help other people do that. Some of those weeds are native, some of them are naturalized from Europe and elsewhere. Um, other th another important thing I don't do is any synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, or insecticides. And all the pollination occurs on the farm by European honeybees, which I keep, and of course, lots of wild pollinators. And I'm grateful to have soil testing since 2003 to demonstrate that the measures I'm taking to improve the soil really are working. That said, I'm a lifelong learner, and what I know fits in that little thimble on that plate, and what I don't know fills the ocean. There's so much to learn, and I learn every year about every species, something that uh, is a new discovery to me, and that makes it a lot of fun. There's lots of surprises. So sometimes when you say things out loud, it makes them seem just so logical. So. Um, native plants sustained indigenous people here for centuries on this continent. And um, so Europeans brought all kinds of plants with them upon colonization and didn't learn from the indigenous populations. The wild food procurement in those populations was primarily women's work. But unfortunately, Native American women and the women settlers rarely shared information. So it was a real missed opportunity to understand what was here and how it could be used. I am um, going to broadly define wildlife way beyond small mammals to include um, many of the species. 6.5 million of them on land and 2.2 in the ocean. And we, we don't even know most of them. And the biodiversity in those ecosystem wildlife species is necessary, though no, never counted in our GDP um, for our own survival, our food production, and our uh, ability to thrive on the planet. 
And it's also beautiful and wonderful if we can um, create the opportunity to become native to the place that was once here. So humans and wildlife can consume and do uh, these seven plants, uh, trees, shrubs, and even a cactus to kind of push the envelope in terms of wild edibles. So that is uh, the native wild persimmon. And that's the first one we'll, uh, I will share with you today. So it can become a 60 foot tree um, in terms of space consideration and how to include that in your landscape. And you need a male and female, although probably there's males in neighborhoods that you wouldn't be aware of, and maybe you wouldn't have to include those. They are pollinated by insects and the wind. It's a larval host plant to the luna moth, which is gorgeous. You will have to be patient though and wait perhaps six to eight years after planting. Um, it, my variety, which was here when we bought the farm, um, ripens in September. Unlike what you read in many books about wild edibles, they do not ripen after the frost. Mine routinely show up on Labor Day and by the frost they're all gone. The most important thing is you do not pick wild persimmon from the tree. When they are ripe, they will fall to the ground. And then you don't get the astringency that is often attributed to them. Oddly enough, it's a berry and it has lots of seeds, one to eight. I describe it as a sweet, creamy, sweet potato-like flavor. It's divine. It's eaten by the birds. I have to beat the raccoons. Um, try not to cross paths with skunks. Deer, squirrels, and possums, and probably others. I bet fox would eat it too. And so I capture those in the drop cloth also, and I harvest them every night before dark, sometimes a little bit after dark, so that I'm not drawing in a lot of um, the wildlife to consume them overnight. And I have many trees that I don't capture from, so there's plenty out there to share. It makes great pie, pudding, bread, cake, ice cream, jam, vinegar, beer. I did a collaboration beer with Four Hands Brewery in St. Louis and Josh Ians of um, Happy Gillis here. That was a wild persimmon, um, wildflower, honey, and ginger beer that was very, very good. Another species I highly recommend is a wild plum, Prunus americana. You might have seen it called any of these names, a beach plum, and in fact, that dark plum on the left side in the photograph, I harvested it on Martha's Vineyard and brought it back to compare it to my Prunus Americana, which is on the right side. Um, it can be yellow, and in fact, that is my yellow wild plum. So I got those from the Missouri Department of Conservation Tree Program the Forest Keeling Nursery, the program that's offered every fall for um, to get saplings at uh, really reasonable prices. And out of the 10 I planted, one was yellow. It can get 10 or 20 feet tall in terms of thinking about where you might put it in a landscape. Um, if you leave it as a shrub, it will sucker and farm uh, what's called a thicket or a colony. I have pruned mine up to form trees uh, so that it, they are 10 to 20 feet. And um, the suckers still come up, but they're easy to manage with mowing and pulling. It is host to many uh, butterflies and moths. And so if, even if you don't want to eat the wild plums, you can share them with songbirds, quail, deer, and lots of small mammals but they are really lovely to eat um, right off the tree. And of course you want them, again, if you capture them when they fall, they are tree ripened and their sugar content will be the highest. Um, pies, jams, sauces. I'm going to try a mead with them this year. Pawpaw is also kind of a thicket forming, small tree. Um, it can get up to 45 feet. 
it does sucker pretty um, generously. But again, you can pull those suckers, replant them elsewhere. Um, it's the largest edible fruit, actually a berry again, indigenous to the United States. And it is wonderful, eaten by birds, raccoons, fox, possums, squirrels, and deer. It is host to the zebra swallowtail, which is just a gorgeous black and white fluttering butterfly. That's even hard to capture on, in a photo because they move so quickly. From a culinary standpoint, they are described as sweet custard-like in flavor. You might think of a banana mango combination. I eat them raw a lot. You can make ice cream and lots of baked desserts out of them. They are very fragile, so that's why you don't ever see them in a grocery store. So in this photograph, they're just beginning to turn yellow. And when they wrap in, you can smell them. They are just lovely. Another favorite that I'm uh, becoming familiar with is spicebush, Lindira benzoin. Um, this is relatively new to me. I planted it probably five years ago, and it's very productive. In the photo on the left, I took that just a few days ago. Those are the um, unripe ber berries that are edible and the leaves are edible. And then in the fall, it turns a beautiful yellow and produces, ripens up these uh, red berries. So it is a shrub in the laurel family, but it is native to the Eastern United States, um, Eastern North America. It's called spice bush, common spice bush, or wild allspice because that is what it can replace in your spice cabinet. It grows six to 12 feet. Um, I have it as an understory bush uh, below some mature trees. It does like decent um, moisture, but doesn't have to be wet. It is, um, host to the spicebush swallowtail, uh, butterfly, and lots of others. Um, and over 20 species of game and songbirds eat those berries. In fact, I have to uh, beat the cardinals to them. They just love them. From a culinary perspective, it's a gold mine. You can eat the leaves, the stems, make a tea from the uh, stems and branches. And the berries do taste similar to allspice. It's kind of a warm spice that you can use in baking and for pies. I'm thinking of trying to dry them and use them in a, a rub recipe for um, meat. The other favorite, it's hard to choose favorites, I love all of these, is service berry, which you might have um, heard referred to or seen in catalogs as Shadbush or Juneberry or Saskatoon. Um, they ripen pretty much in June. It is a small tree or multi stemmed clump farming shrub again. Um, the fruit is red and turns almost black. It's also loved by the birds. I do have many birds here and browsed by deer and rabbits, although I have herds of deer and they haven't taken them out. So it's more the birds that really love the fruit. It's host to many caterpillars of moths and butterflies. And I would just say you could substitute this berry anywhere you'd, you, you would use blueberry. In fact, I prefer it to blueberry. And it's, for me, it's lower maintenance because you don't have to pay so much attention to soil acidity. The other favorite I have here is hazelnut, Corillus americana. It gets to eight to 16 feet with a spread in its crown of 10 to 15 feet. It's beautiful as well. Feeds squirrels, deer, turkey, and lots of woodpeckers. And I think even the blue jays like it. It feeds many different leaf be beetles and hoppers, moth caterpillars, and the luna moth again. It is delicious, but it's smaller than the European hazelnut that you're used to finding in the grocery store. So it is a little more t tedious to prepare it, but um, good things come in small packages. It's really delicious if you can take the time to do that. 
The other um, fruit that I really like is the elderberry which is blooming right now and the it also suckers so many of these will be very um i don't want to say necessarily aggressive but um resilient and very able to hold their own in in um, environments if you give them a chance you can mulch or mow around them if you want to keep them as more just specimens in your landscape. This fruit is a dark purple to blackberry when it's ripe. And you definitely want to eat it right ripe. You do not want to eat any of the green berries. And in fact, the stems and leaves are known to be toxic. So you're looking at just uh, harvesting the berries. I've read but not tried that you can drop them into um, a freezer bag and then um, shake them or roll them off uh, frozen they're easier to take off you can also use a fork to kind of scrape them off the stem um, at, or you can snip them um, again somewhat time-consuming but worth the effort um, the blossoms which I showed you in that first farm sign photo um, are called elder blow and are lovely if you uh, shake them into pancake, muffin, or a funnel cake recipe. I just received a recipe from a German woman who remembers um, making them with her grandmother growing up and um, dipping, dipping them into um, a flour mixture with some sugar and then deep frying them like a funnel cake might be. They are very fragrant. Um, honeybees love the blossoms as do many bee flies and, and various beetles. Um, it's The flowers are covered with pollinators. If you did nothing else, it would be a great nectar source for many pollinators. Um, Eastern bluebird, cardinals, catbird, mockingbirds, robins, house finches, red-eyed vireos, cedar waxwing, and the white-throated sparrows are all big fans of the elderberry fruit. So if you're um, a birder or appreciate the birds, it would be a great one to include in your landscape. And then the um, perhaps the ringer in these. Um, edible natives is prickly pear cactus. It is uh, actually native to this area of um, the North American continent and but there are like 150 species. They're all over and in various um, varieties and sizes and shapes and colors and flavors. It too feeds the bees and beetles and butterflies uh, the blossom is lovely. Uh, it just finished blooming, but you could put toss those petals in a salad and it could offer some food security. Um, you can uh, eat the cactus fruit, which is referred to frequently as an Indian fig or a tuna, and you have to peel it, and it has what's called glow kids, which are tiny splinter-like uh, needles in the fruit. So the fruit is that pink um, projection on top of the leaf and you can peel it um, before or you can use a torch or a stove flame and burn off those tiny splinter-like thorns before you peel it and you might want to wear gloves anyway. Uh, but you can use it for appetizers, soups, salads, entrees. The pads are edible, and um, that's a whole nother preparation um, challenge. You cut the spines off and pop the, the spines out of the pad and can cut it up for a raw salad or cook it. Um, it has lots of potential for food. And I am just 
at the baby stages of learning how to use that. In Mexico and even in Arizona and New Mexico, the tunas are larger and per perhaps sweeter, um, but I think part of it is part of enjoying it is learning how to use it. So if you incorporate any or all of these edibles or any of the hundreds of others, we could incorporate native plants into our landscapes. You will be uh, restoring, regenerating biological communities, which are very rich in species and healthier overall and more productive than those of landscapes that are depleted. In this photograph, you can see a European honeybee eating um, an overripe wild persimmon. And on the left are butterflies eating overripe or very ripe wild plum. And I didn't realize until I ventured into this fruit growing how much these, um, this wildlife depends on the nectar and sugars in rotting fruit. Um, also called bledding, I believe. So you don't necessarily want to keep everything super squeaky clean because when many of these fruits are edible and very ripe, which is July, August, um, there is really a lack of nectar sources for these creatures because of drought and what else is available. So the best time we know to plant a tree, of course, is 20 years ago, uh, but I'm still planting trees. I plant dozens every year because the second best time is to plant today. Obviously not today in June, but every year. Um, it's rarely too late to do something to reintroduce natives into your landscape and any action you take now will have some effect. It may just be different than if you had done it earlier or at a different site. Just set aside any um, regrets or um, uncertainties and take some action now to include natives into your landscape. I have to include this uh, quote from a Wild Fruits that was um, an unpublished manuscript put together by Dean from Thoreau. And I like it because um, he refers to a fruit tree that had been dying ever since he was a boy but not dead yet. And you frequented by the woodpecker and the squirrel, but deserted by the owner who didn't have enough faith to look under the branches. So um, some of my trees aren't necessarily what might be referred to as perfect specimens, but they still bear hundreds of pounds of fruit for me and for wildlife. And if you've read Lorax to your children or uh, school children or grandchildren, you'll remember that he says, unless someone take, like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So I hope you take action and um, figure out how you could incorporate some, some of these plants into your your life, your um, ecosystem, your landscape, if not now, it's sometime in the future. And these are some of the uh, resources that I've used over time. I have lots of books. Um, and I, hearing that invasive plants are coming up, that oddly enough, the two uh, first references have to do with um, invasive plants. And the native alternatives is nice, includes some fruit. Um, the Plum Crazy book was written about the beech plum, but I use all the recipes for the uh, Prunus Americana here. Um, Papa was written recently, uh, doesn't have many recipes in it. And then these two um, websites are uh, USDA.gov and Plants for a Future is a good resource as well. And um, if you would like to know more or have questions for me, you can go to my website, prairiebirthdayfarm.com and click on the contact link. 
um, because I am selling less to chefs now, what I am doing is selling farm samplers to individuals who want to um, experience what happens on the farm across the seasons. So if you have any interest or curiosity about that, let me know. And uh, with that, Mary, I think I'm ready for questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Linda. All right, let's dive right into our questions. Um, Sammy asks, how do you set up your cloths to catch the fruit that falls? Are they on stakes? Yes, um, they are on sort of a rebar fence post. Um, so you can get these drop cloths that are, um, have grommets in them and you can suspend them with bungee cords. Uh, sometimes if it's next to a fence, you can use a fence. Um, you're just, whatever you can hang them on. Oh, um, actually this year I started because some of my trees border the reconstructed prairie, which is you know, four to six feet tall. I'm using the bird, uh, shepherd, bird feeder shepherd hooks, you know, the hooks that you can step into the ground and hang your bird feeders on. You can suspend a, a use those as post to keep your cloth up off the ground. Awesome. All right. Um, Molly asks if you can discuss which of the plants that you mentioned need a companion for pollination. Need a companion. Well, the wild plum, I don't know if I can get back to my uh, presentation. Should be able to, yeah. Um, no, it's the wild persimmon um, that needs a male. But uh, tell me the question again. Do I need like another uh, tree for pollination? This, the question says, will you discuss which of these need a companion for pollination? So which, which of the... So yeah, the only one out of there is the um, wild persimmon, I believe. Gotcha. Um, Patrick, Great question. Patrick asks, how many honeybee colonies do you keep? Well, I've had as many as seven, <clears throat> and during 2017, um, the year of the uh, Japanese beetle infestation was also the year of hive beetle infestation, and I lost all seven hives. So I am now uh, rebuilding my hives, and I have two, and may uh, actually be picking up a third from a friend who's moving. Gotcha. But um, I keep honey, keeping honeybees are is getting harder because of the introduced pests um, and the lack of uh, nectar sources. So um, it's really good to to be planting lots of the nectar sources. Like, gosh, when the wild plums are in bloom, the tree just hums with pollinators, and elder flower is always covered in in pollinators. Um, really, they're really supportive of pollination um, activities, European as well as the native bees, and they're so important. Um, Nancy asks, what is best and tastiest variety of service berry for fruit? Well, I know there are cultivars, and um, I do have a couple of those. One is called Regent, and one is called, I think, an apple. But um, even the native, uh, just from the Conservation Tree Program, are wonderful. They're not what I would describe as juicy, but more um, uh, creamy, almost. So, um, and of course, the season can make a difference, whether or not we have uh, late frost or drought. So even if you choose a, a particular cultivar, it will be responsive to whatever the season is. And I actually didn't mention that having this kind of biodiversity really is a, I, I consider it my best crop insurance because like this year we had really late frost and we had 80 degrees and then frost. So many things were in bloom. So by having multiple 
um, fruits that bear at different times and bloom at different times, it pretty much guarantees that I have at least something every season. I never lo lose the entire thing. And, you know, the old all your eggs in one basket problem. If you only have one fruit and uh, the season doesn't go right for it, you can be in trouble. Absolutely. Um, Karen asks for the best defense against ground squirrels that get into everything and eat them before we get a chance to. Oh, wow. Electric fence. <laughs> um, aggressive trapping. Uh, I know they eat through wire. Um, so, oh, that's really hard. You might have to harvest uh, pre-plant ripened because the animals know when they're ripe. If I miss um, the ripeness, the animals tell me because they come in and get them. Now, that... That said, that means they're not always at their peak flavor, but uh, I know squirrels, especially in urban settings, are a terrible problem. Um, one of the most important things is probably you don't want to let them get a taste of it. Um, boy, I wish it, I would be uh, a billionaire if I could figure that out. I'm sorry I don't have better answers, but try to keep them from getting it, getting the fruit, um, having alternative sources for them to eat, like more nuts, probably so the biodiversity may be um, helpful in that they'll have other things to eat. Um, but trapping and removal, and um, I had a friend who, <laughs> who actually did hook up on a second floor window a, uh, and a little electric fence with a fence charger to keep them out of the bird feeder. So, uh, they are awfully clever. The other thing I've done is invested in a wildlife camera so that I can film how the creatures, and they're all hungry, obviously they all have to eat, are accessing my food so I can figure out how to outsmart them. So that might be another um, way to look at the problem is find out how they're accessing the tree or the branch. Is there something you can put around the trunk? Can you prune a nearby tree so they can't leap from another branch onto the fruit? Um, it's a complicated issue. Those outdoor cameras are getting more and more accessible these days, so that's a plus. Yes. Um, I've got a lot of different questions asking about soil, light, and water requirements for um, a lot of these different plants. Okay. So, um, I should get, if I could get back to, and I don't know how to do that, my list. Okay, so the wild persimmon is like a 30 to 60 foot tree. So that will capture its own sunlight because it's gonna be so tall. The wild plum I have growing, um, it likes, it does better in direct sunlight. It can be a um, kind of a um, border tree. So it could be on the edge, an edge tree of a, a woodland. Um, but it will probably produce most if it's in direct sunlight and um, needs regular water if, if it's going to be most productive. The pawpaw is known as an understory tree, but it's being researched at Missouri Southwest Missouri, um, the Southwest Missouri Fruit Experimentation Station. Uh, it's just growing out in rows as an agroforestry project. So it's out in direct sunlight. Um, it does like its water and will do better with water, uh, but can be grown as an understory. Um, and actually you'll find them out in, in parks and um, natural areas in ravines under pretty deep shade. Uh, the spice bush is an understory and likes decent water, but can go to dry, wet to dry. Um, hazelnut is a trooper. It is mostly out in direct sunlight, but I have one that gets half day shade and it's productive as well. It probably does best out in sun. Serviceberry can be um, sun part shade. 
And of course, they all do better with decent rains. You know, the trick with uh, reoccurring droughts is you have to be more attentive to regular water. I do not have an irrigation system, so I spot water all these species just with a hose. Um, and once they're established, they do better. And if you do a lot of mulching, you don't have to water as much. It'll moderate soil temperature, uh, preserve moisture, and uh, protect the, um, the roots from surface damage. It's a, always a good thing to do. I'm uh, a true believer in mulching, lots of mulching. And um, let's see, was that it? The cactus, ooh, it can be out in a very harsh, dry, bad soil. It grows on glades. So it can be in one of the worst places you have. Get it started and it will do just fine. I had some cactus pads broke off, fell on the ground and rooted themselves due to benign neglect. So when you can't grow anything else, try that cactus. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, well, we'll sort of take one more question, which is from Greg, asking if these slides will be, will be available after this presentation, which they will. Um, this, the recording of this presentation will be available at deeprootskc.org slash webinars. And you can see this recording as well as recordings from previous sessions. So thank you so much, Linda, for joining us today. And thank you for everyone at home to join us as well. If you have a question that we didn't get to today, please feel free to reach out to us with those at hello at deeprootskc.org via email and we can get your question answered for you. As we finish today, please head over to our website at deeprootskc.org where we can help you find plants, plant a garden, locate helpful resources, and more. As I mentioned earlier, you can also watch recordings of those previous webinars. If you're enjoying this series, we'd sincerely appreciate your support in the form of a donation, and you can do that on our website as well. Don't forget to mark your calendars for the virtual edition of our Planet Native Conference in September, with more details to come on our website at planetnative.org. Next week, we will conclude this series with a presentation by Linda Lairbaum on invasive species in large landscapes. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Linda, and stay safe out there, everybody.